We are still working our way through the uh, prophecies in the New Testament. And uh, Brother Taylor ended up having to do some work-related stuff this morning. And so he is not with us. So um, you have me, the second, the second string Sunday school teacher. And we're in uh, Revelation chapter 10. It's amazing, you know, I started doing this a couple of years ago, and whenever I was teaching Sunday school, I'd just do the next section of prophecies in the New Testament, and we went through, you know, all the Gospels and Acts and the Epistles and so on, and, and now we're in the middle of Revelation. Of course, Revelation is the biggest prophetic section in the New Testament, I guess you'd say. Uh, today we'll be starting chapter 10. I don't know how far we're going to get, um, but... The, the passage is deemed by Bible scholars who write books and make outlines and that sort of thing as being the second parenthetical division in the book. Um, so we've come to the second parenthetical division and it goes for about a chapter and a half. It goes down to you know the last half of chapter 11. Um, just to, uh, to get a start on it, let's go ahead and read verses well, let's start in verse 1. We'll read 1 and 2. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. And it goes on from there to tell us about... Um, him crying with a loud voice and the seven thunders uttering their voices. So there's a lot to go through. As I understand a parenthesis, a parenthesis is an explanation or a pause uh, in the narrative. But to me, this doesn't really seem to be a pause in the narrative. Uh, it seems to be more of a description of another event that does not really occur as a part of the trumpet judgments. Because remember, we're in the middle of the trumpet judgments here. And it, it's classified as a parenthetical division. But this one, it seems to me to fit fairly chronologically between the fifth and sixth trumpet. And, and I say that because we get a couple of statements in the passage which leads me to believe that it is, it is chronological. Like, for example, uh, Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. And uh, Josh, why don't you read that? Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So this is in the middle of this parenthesis, if you will, and yet very clearly we're given a, a time reference uh, to the voice of the seventh angel. Another indication to me is the way that the second parenthesis ends. Uh, if you turn to Revelation chapter 11, verse 14, this is where the parentheses ends. Uh, Brother Young, in the back there, would you read Revelation 11, 14 for me? All right, so it's classified as a parentheses, but I don't think we need to think of it as a parentheses per se. Usually a parentheses is explanatory. When we use it in a sentence or in a paragraph or whatever, it's explanatory in some way. But in this case, though it's classified as a parenthesis, I think it's more the idea of here is the timeline that he is writing concerning the trumpets. Oh, and by the way, something else is happening over here now. And so I think it's a parenthesis in that way where we're actually given extra information that kind of parallels what is happening in the uh, original narrative. So... I hope that helps you. But the idea there is that we're given more. And uh, Revelation 11.3 uh, would, would also be helpful. Yeah. We make this observation because part of the parentheses deals with two witnesses who will preach for three and a half years. Uh, Revelation 11.3, you want to read that, brother? Yeah, sure, sure. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand all right, so we're not going to get technical with exactly how many days th that is and so forth and so on. But, you know, that's 
basically three and a half years. It's a time frame that's given. And so it deals with two witnesses who preach for three and a half years. And so the, the first portion of this parentheses is found in verses 1 through 11. And it deals with an angel who comes. And we read verses uh, 1 and 2. So I want to pick up in verse 3 and actually read the rest of the chapter and just kind of talk about the whole chapter and refer back to it as we go. But in verse 3 he says, And he cried with a loud voice, when he, uh, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lift up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. I, I've always liked verse 11. Because if I was John and the angel said this to me, then I would go, great. I get to get off of this island. Because he's currently on the Isle of Patmos and he's stranded out there. He's been exiled out there. And uh, I don't know if you know much about Patmos, but... You know, it's, it's not a place where there are many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So clearly, he is going to be freed from that at some point. He doesn't know when or, or where or how yet, but uh, at least at this point, he knows he will be. So there is the, the passage uh, for discussion, and we're immediately amazed, or at least I'm amazed, at the description of the one that's referenced as another mighty angel, and were it not for the statement that he was an angel, it might be easy to assume that this is Christ because we read in the New Testament of Christ and he's described as one having a face like the sun and feet like pillars of fire and so on. And so uh, that kind of takes us back to some of the symbology or the symbolic language, I should say, that's used in Revelation chapter 1. And so you would look at that and go, well, maybe this mighty angel is actually Jesus. But the second portion of this incredible parentheses is the statement of the seven thunders and we'll get back to the angel in a minute but we've got a statement about the seven thunders which john the apostle hears and he understands he knows what they say and he's about to write it all down and then he's told not to write what he heard doesn't that make you curious at all and just when you thought it couldn't get any weirder, I mean, an angel coming down and, you know, and all of that, that's, that's already, you know, beyond the norm. And then he hears a thunder or thunders and he's about to write and he says, don't write that. And just when it can't get much odder, it gets odder. And he is told to go and take the little book from the angel and eat it. Um, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Does anybody know where else we find something like that? <laughs> yes, it's in the major prophets. Good, Ezekiel. So since you since you're on that, we'll let you read that. Ezekiel chapter three, verses one through three. Yes. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat the, that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels 
with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. So in Ezekiel's case, the book that he ate was sweet. In John's case, the book is sweet to the taste, but bitter in the stomach. More on this in a little bit later. The parentheses opens with the introduction of this mighty angel who comes down from heaven, having, he's clothed with a cloud. I, 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 you know, try to imagine what that must mean, you know, or what John saw. He describes it as one being clothed with a cloud, a rainbow on his head, his face is the sun, his feet is pillars of fire. And again, the description, you know, draws you back to chapter one, where we have the vision of Christ, but this is not Christ. For this mighty angel swears by him that liveth forever and ever. You see that in Revelation chapter 10, verse 6. He does not swear by himself, but he swears by one greater than himself. It is an assumption, but some think that this might be Michael the archangel. It's an assumption. As far as I can determine, there's no real support for this in, in the Bible, in the passage specifically. Uh, it would be easier for me to, to think it was Gabriel because Gabriel is always delivering messages in the scripture. So if I was going to have any kind of support, I'd go with Gabriel. But again, it's an assumption. We don't know. We have no idea. Some think that this angel is the same angel that is referred to in chapter 5 and verse 2 or chapter 7, verse 2, chapter 8, verse 3, 18, verse 2. Uh, but what we need to do is examine those passages, which we're going to do, and see how that holds up. Okay, how does that hold up under cross-examination, under scrutiny? So we're going to look at those passages I gave you. And the first one is, is Revelation 5.2. Remember what we're doing here. We're trying to figure out if, if this is the same angel or not. Okay. Does it have any implications, by the way? Uh, not really. I don't, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe somewhere down the line it does. As far as I can see, not a whole lot. Okay. But Revelation 5.2. Um, let's see. Who, who wants to read that? Brother Ed, you're there. You want to read that? And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. All right, so this angel is described as being a mighty angel. Contextually, he is carrying a book, though he does not keep it. The book is given to Christ. So circumstantial evidence, while not conclusive, would allow for the angel of Revelation 5 to be the same angel as in Revelation 10, but that's not necessarily so, okay? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. The next two passages, Revelation 7-2, Brother Kenny, can you turn there? And uh, Revelation 8-3, and uh, let's see, Emmanuel, would you read that for us? Revelation 7-2, Revelation 8-3, the next two passages merely state another angel. So, let's read those. And I saw another angel ascending from the east. All right. All right, go ahead. Revelation 8, 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. All right, so in Revelation 7, 2 and Revelation 8, 3, they begin by saying another angel. Now, there really isn't enough information here to be dogmatic about anything. You can't dogmatically prove anything except that they were another angel, making them different from the angel that was previously talked about. Okay, so you got an angel they're talking about, you know, here's an angel and then another angel comes along. And so that's the idea there. Uh, Revelation 18.1 would be a better argument. Uh, so let's look at that one. Uh, Brother Isaac, did you read yet? You didn't read, right? No. Okay, can you read that, Revelation 18.1? And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with its glory. Okay, so Revelation 18.1 would be a better argument. After all, isn't the angel described as coming down from heaven and, you know, having great power and shining brightly and he lights up his surroundings and that sort of thing. But the problem is, if this is the same angel as in Revelation 10, why didn't John just say that? But he doesn't. The task of identifying angels in Revelation is, is a bit daunting. 
um, because the book gives us really quite a variety of descriptions, okay? And I'm just going to rattle off a bunch of things here for you, but you've got the angels of the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, right? Uh, strong angel in Revelation 5, 1. Angels in chorus, Revelation chapter 5, verse 11. Revelation chapter 7, verse 11. 7, 11, hey, that's good. Uh, four angels holding the winds, Revelation 7, 1. Uh, the angel with the seal, Revelation 7, 2. Angels with trumpets, chapter 8 and verse 2. Uh, the angel with the golden censer, we just read about, chapter 8, verse 3. Angels pronouncing the three woes, woe, 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 and all the horses in the world stopped running. Anyway, Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. Uh, you got the angel of the bottomless pit, Revelation 9, 11. Four angels in the river Euphrates, chapter 9, verse 14. Mighty angels, chapter 10, verse 1, chapter 18, verse 21. Angels at war in heaven, uh, chapter 12, verse 7. You've got pronouncing angels, you know, in numerous places. In chapter 14, you got verse 6, verse 8, verse 9, verse 15, where angels are making pronouncements. Judgment angels, chapter 14, verses 17 through 19. Angels with vials, there's seven of those guys. Uh, chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Angels of the waters, chapter 16, verse 5. Bright angels, chapter 18, verse 1. Angels of the sun, chapter 19, verse 17. Angels with a bottom uh, with a key to the bottomless pit, chapter 20, verse 1. Angels at the gates of New Jerusalem, chapter 21, verse 12. And I didn't even list them all. That was just enough to make you go, wow, that's mind-boggling. The fact is, angels are mentioned 76 times in 72 verses in the book of Revelation. There's angels all over the place in this book. The point is that this particular visiting angel that we're talking about here in Revelation chapter 10 um, it is the point of, but the point of this angel is not so much who he is. The point of this angel is what he is carrying and what he says. That's what really the point or the thrust of the whole chapter is. Um, and I went through all of that because, you know, when you're preparing lessons like this, you, you tend to prepare the lesson and you do your best from your own head. And then after that, you look at your notes and say, I wonder if there's something that I missed or something I don't know or something of that nature. And then you begin reading commentaries. And as I read these commentaries, I like to read them critically. You know what I mean? I don't like to just say, oh, well, you know, John Gill says this. So bless, bless, bless. It must be the word of God, you know. Uh, you know, you got to be careful with commentaries because they're written by men. Men are finite. Men make mistakes, okay? So read them critically. As I, as I was reading through certain commentaries and doing so critically, I found that there are some men that think that this angel is Jesus. And I'm thinking if it was Jesus, why didn't John just say that? You know what I'm saying? It would be very easy. He would know that. I mean, he just saw him in chapter 1, so he'd pretty much know who he is. He mentions him again in chapter, what is it, chapter 5, where... You know, the lion of, of the tribe of Judah, you know, the lamb that was slain very clearly. He, we, there's no questions there when Jesus is spoken of. But here there's questions. So I'm just going to step out on a limb here and say that it's an angel. All right. Deep stuff there. It's an angel. What's he carrying? Well, it's a book. We're not given a description of the contents so, I don't know about you, but I'm left to wonder what it actually said. And so the only real clues of what could possibly be in the book come from the statements of the angel and the reaction that John would experience when he ate it. Those are our clues. That's all we get. The book is bitter and sweet. Bittersweet. Going back to Ezekiel, remember what happened in Ezekiel's case, right? In Ezekiel's case... He was tasting the bitter chastening of God upon Israel. Yet the book was sweet. It's interesting because in Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 10, the role was described as being full of lamentations and mourning and woe. But Ezekiel said it was sweet. Hmm. Now, that's not much to go on. It's really not a whole lot to build your case on. 
you can't really be dogmatic. So I, I'm going to state this in the form of a question. Is it possible that the book was sweet because it contained the wonderful completion of God's great work with his people? After all, what is it that we read in verse 7? Revelation 10, 7. Who wants to read that? We read it once already, but let's read it again. Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. Yes, go ahead. So maybe that's what is written in the in the book. Maybe we get the consummation of the mystery of God. So the book might be sweet because the mystery of God will soon be finished. And we'll talk more about the mystery later. But for now, just know that it is a good thing. Okay. But then maybe it's also bitter because it contains the completion of judgments and wrath as well. Because the last years, if you will, uh, the tribulation period specifically, uh, is a time of judgment and wrath. So maybe uh, that's why. Notice I'm using the word maybe a lot because I don't know. But when we read it, these are things that we constantly begin to think about. What was in the book? Why was it sweet and why was it bitter? And, and why, why was he told to eat it and all of these things? We have all of these questions, which are good questions to ponder as you're reading the scriptures. Ask lots of questions. You'd be surprised at how much you learn trying to answer the questions you ask. I think there is a lesson, though, to be learned as we study the book of Revelation. The truths of the book can be exciting, and they often are. I mean, you read about things, it's like, wow, that's exciting. You know, it might not be so exciting if you're there and you don't have any water to drink and everything's blood. But we're reading about it, and we're seeing what God is going to do to bring judgment upon the sinfulness of man. And it's like, wow, this is exciting. So you read it and it can be exciting, making it sweet, if you will, to receive. But then after you come to grasp the horribleness, the absolute horribleness of two thirds of the world's population dying in seven years through these horrendous judgments, which are just, I might add, because God is bringing them. And then add to that all of the other wicked things that are being done by man. And add to that all the other wicked things that are being done by the Antichrist. And you read all of that and it begins to, it begins to sink in that this is called the tribulation for a reason. It's a horrible time period. And when you begin to think about that, then suddenly it's not as sweet as it once was. It becomes heavy and it starts to become a bitter thing. Let's go back to verse 2. Revelation chapter 10, verse 2. And uh, let's see. Brother brother Willie, would you read that for us? And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth. So we've already discussed the little book, coming to the conclusion that it most likely, maybe, possibly, contains the completion of the judgment and the wrath of God. But what of this angel standing upon the sea and on the earth? How big do you have to be to stand upon the ground and to stand upon the sea? I was picturing as big monumental. Uh, the, I guess you could be, you know, like the water's lapping here, and technically speaking, yeah. maybe. But I don't get that vision in my mind. I don't know what you get in your mind, but I see something bigger. Yeah, much. A lot bigger. How much bigger? I don't know. Not going to go so far as some televangelist, you know, I saw a 500 foot Jesus or nothing like that. But, um, you know, this is, this is a big dude. Okay. Um, and again, remember what we're talking about. We're talking about the book of Revelation where a lot of things that we're seeing here are symbolic of something. Clearly the idea, at least to me, the idea seems to indicate that there is a universal application here to the angel's message. He's standing upon the sea and he's also standing upon the earth. And I, I draw that conclusion based on the way that the Apostle John uses the, the symbology of the earth and the sea together in other passages. And he does this in a couple of other places as well. Um, so let's read those. Revelation 5.13. I'm going to just pass these out and make it easier. Um, let's see. Let's start. Let's start. Over here with Brother Isaac, you take Revelation 5.13. Um, Josh, you take Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. 
And um, brother Carrie, you take Revelation 12, 12. And I want you to notice the way that the sea and the earth are used in these passages, okay? Revelation 5, 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now, I'm not a very expressive person when I write. Um, I'll write something and then I have to go back and then throw in adjectives and adverbs and things like that because what I write is so very plain. Uh, if I wrote Revelation 5.13, this is what it would initially say until I went back to proofread it. It would just say something along the lines of, and everybody, I heard everybody saying blessing and honor and glory and power. But he doesn't write that. Instead, he writes in heaven and on the earth and in the sea and in the, under the earth and all that's in them. You know, what's he saying? He's saying everybody, okay? The earth and the sea, you know, kind of typifying that. Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. You read that and you go, hold on a minute, hold on, hold on just one second here. Because in verse 2, it ends by saying, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. Then in verse 3, don't hurt the earth or the sea. So what we have here is kind of a, a dual thing going on here. In, in verse 2, it is symbolic of everybody, because that's who they actually are supposed to hurt. But in verse 3, the literal earth, the literal sea, the literal trees. Okay, So it's interesting the way that, that that comes across. And in chapter 12, verse 12, who did I give that to? Revelation 12, 12? Yes, sir. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So going back to John, going back to what he says about the angel, the angel comes down and he stands on the heaven, I mean, he stands on the earth and he stands on the sea. I think characteristic to the writing of the book of Revelation, when you find that kind of combination used together, which we've looked at some places, that basically it is a universal message. So the message of this mighty angel is a universal message. At the very least, it has a universal um, application to his impact. So I think that's the idea there. Okay, And then in verse 3, it says that he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So... Um, how many of you have heard a lion roar personally, not on TV where you turn the volume up and down? Anybody? How about not even in a zoo? Maybe a little bit. Yeah. I, I remember, I remember as a kid going to, I think it was a San Diego zoo, but no, it wasn't. It was a zoo in Texas, but I heard a lion roar and I mean, I almost, I almost peed my pants. I'm not, I'm not being, I'm not trying to be, I'm serious. It scared me. It was loud. It was really loud. But I want you to notice what the verse says. Notice very carefully. He says that the angel cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth. So we, we don't have a lion here roaring. What do we have? We have an angel roaring. The roar of a lion is said to be so powerful that it can be heard up to five miles away. Five miles that's quite a distance. The roar of a lion can reach, they, they measured uh, the roar of a lion to be on the average uh, around 114 decibels. That's louder, or almost as loud, let me say it that way, almost as loud as a jet aircraft taking off. So, you know, when you're standing out there at, uh, you know, EOR, end of runway, or you're at the gas station on base, which is, you know, uh, 150 feet or 100, 100 meters away or whatever it is, you're standing there and that jet starts to take off and it goes by and it's, 
and every you feel every you feel your body kind of shake, you know, and and you're going, man, how is it that those guys on the flight line aren't deaf after a week? Ear protection, double ear protection, you know, and they still feel it. That's loud. This angel is that loud. That's the idea. He cries with a loud voice, and then after he cries with a loud voice, what happens next? When he had cried, seven thunders utter their voices. So when the angel cries with a loud voice, then the seven thunders utter their voices. The seven thunders is an interesting study in and of itself. Um, I, I'm left with the impression that when I, when, when I read about the seven thunders uttering their voices, I immediately think of, what do you think? Huh? That's all. That's all you get out of that. The number seven appears a lot in different places. Like you got, didn't wasn't Jesus like whenever he appeared, he had like seven stars. Or something? Seven stars in his right hand, seven candlesticks, seven churches, seven trumpets, seven vials, seven seals. Seven, yeah, there's seven all over the place. Okay, yeah. but that's probably going a little deeper than what I'm thinking. When I when I read in the book of Revelation about seven thunders uttering their voices, I, I just think of the voice of God. Um, but there is absolutely nothing in the passage or the immediate context to prove it. So when I thought of that, I thought, well, why is it that whenever I read about the seven thunders uttering their voices, why do I you know connect that somehow with the voice of God? So I went back through to study, which is always a good thing. And to, to see why I get, get this impression, and, and most likely for me personally, it's from the broad usage of thunders in relation to God. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2, I'm going to read some passages here quickly. So 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 10, the adversaries of the, thor of, of the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces, out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. Second Samuel chapter 22, verse 14. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered His voice. Psalm 18, verse 13. The Lord also thundered in the heavens and the highest gave His voice half stones and coals of fire. So, or hailstones and coals of fire. So, when you get to the book of Revelation, then it becomes especially evident to me. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 5. Out of the throne... Well, you know, there's the throne of God and then there's these 24 seats that the elders are sitting on. But this is not an out of one of the seats that the elders are sitting on. This is out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Hmm. Yeah, Revelation 4, 5. And then Revelation 8, 5, it says, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Okay. Revelation eleven nineteen. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. And then Revelation sixteen eight eighteen, I'm sorry, Revelation sixteen eighteen. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. That was a big earthquake. So, thunder or thunderings, by the way, can be found in nine places in the book of Revelation. And in nearly every case, we come away with the impression that the thunderings are possibly, probably, the voice of God. So, I get that impression here. That these seven thunders are uttering their voices are not the seven thunders of clouds. They're not seven angels with big mouths. Um, I just get the impression that this is the voice of God. Now, again, circumstantial evidence at best, but that's what I give you to explain why I think that's the case. If you still got, if you still got questions, great. There's the book. Dig in. Find your own answer. The interesting thing to me is that John clearly understood what was said. The seven thunders utter their voices, and whatever they say, 
John understood it. Now, I don't know if he understood what it meant exactly or if he just understood the words, you know. For example, maybe the Seven Thunders said something like, uh, pizza is best at Anthony's. And, you know, he understood the words but didn't quite understand how that could, that could possibly be dominoes. I don't know exactly what he understood about the message itself, but he understood enough to be able to write it down. And so he gets ready to write it down. And he's specifically commanded, uh, no, don't write that. Yeah, it does. Revelation chapter 10, verse 4. You want to read that for us, brother? 10, 4? Roger. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Yeah, seal them up, write them not. It is a fruitless endeavor to suppose upon what the seven thunders uttered. It is not for man to know. The most you can do, the best you can do is make suppositions. And there have been a lot of suppositions. Um, one commentator said that it was a judgment too terrifying to be revealed. Another one said, God's personal expression of his divine purposes. In other words, God said exactly what he was going to do. I wonder if it has anything to do with time being declared ended. We're going to get to that. Yeah. Something maybe that would be revealed at a later time. Don't write it now, John. It'll be revealed later. But the book of Revelation is the last book, so that one doesn't work for me. Uh, or maybe another series of judgments that, uh, you know... All the judgments that we know about have already been given, so I don't see where that's the case. Yes? In verse 6 where he says, and I spoke with 